my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Riley, Associate Director for Behavioral and Social Sciences Research and Director of the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Riley has held this position since 2015 and has served in several leadership positions with NIH since 2005, including with the National Institute of Mental Health, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and the National Cancer Institute. He received his undergraduate degree in psychology and sociology from James Madison University and his MS and PhD in clinical psychology from Florida State University. Dr. Riley, uh, welcome back to FSU, if even virtually, uh, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Mike, thank you so much, and, and thanks for the virtual sort of tour back to uh, FSU. It's, uh, I wish I could be there in person. It's been a long time since I've been on campus. So. And um, I, I know that you had Tara, another FSU alumni yesterday. Um, so we're, we're trying to um, represent the alumni of FSU as best as we can at the NIH. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and for this time. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Um, I thought I would start with just a, a brief overview of the office that I run and the mission that we have at NIH and the Office of Behavioral and Social Sciences Research. So we're a coordination office um, at the NIH for behavioral and social sciences. As you probably know, there are 27 institutes and centers. They all function slightly differently. They all have different sort of uh, missions and different priorities. Um, and the behavioral and social sciences are essentially sort of scattered about among all of those institutes and centers. So our responsibility is to ensure that people are working together, that the appropriate sort of research is being um, performed, that when there's potential overlap, we're trying to resolve some of those, and probably most importantly, in places where the current structure of the NIH produces sort of gaps in the field, especially in the social and behavioral sciences, that we sort of pick those up and make sure they're adequately addressed. So that's our sort of general mission in terms of what we do. Um, we have a strategic plan uh, that focuses on three scientific priorities. One is on basic and applied research synergy. Um, the concern, particularly in the behavioral and social sciences, has been that there's a bit of a broken or fragmented system in that translation from basic research to applied um, research, and that we need to do some work to sort of strengthen that uh, translation over the course of time. Another priority in methods, measures, and data infrastructures um, in the behavioral and social sciences so that we can strengthen those and, and use sort of the latest cutting edge measure, measures and um, advanced methods. Um, we've been particularly sort of interested of late with um, artificial intelligence, machine learning approaches, computational modeling approaches, those types of things. Um, and then uh, the other scientific priority is around the adoption of behavioral and social science research um, in the field. I think one of the things that concerned me when I started at OBSSR and began talking to some of the um, institute directors is that they would say, you know, we fund behavioral and social science research. We just don't see much uptake of it out in the field in the real world. And so that's been a real concern for us in terms of how do we promote that and make sure that it happens more readily than it currently does. So next slide. Just to give you a sense of the funding at, uh, at the NIH for behavioral and social science research, approximately 10%, uh, maybe a little more now, 12, 13% in more recent years, um, are grants that have a behavioral and social science research component. So it's a fairly significant sort of slice of the NIH pie um, that's related to behavioral and social sciences research. It's been increasing over the course of time, a little bit of dip in 2020, which we're not too worried about and probably assume that's at least part because of all the COVID things that have been going on and the number of applications and number of grants that we're able to fund in the field. Um, but holding steady at about 6,000 grants a year uh, that, that we fund in the behavioral and social sciences. And as opposed to our biomedical colleagues, a, a bit in reverse, most of about two thirds of the research we fund is mostly applied and about a third of it is more basic or foundational research that we fund in the behavioral and social sciences. Our biomedical colleagues reverse that. Um, probably about two thirds of it is basic and only about a third of it's applied, but that's because they have the strong pharmaceutical and medical device world that helps sort of produce the applied um, research and also um, the implementation and dissemination of it. So next slide. Um, if you wanna know which, um, 
institute or, or center at the NIH you should um, submit your grant application to. Um, this gives you at least a little bit of a sense of the uh, number of new uh, behavioral and social science research grants that were funded by IC in fiscal year 20. Um, there are a few that are sort of the, the standards for us in terms of fairly large amount of uh, funding in the behavioral and social sciences, National Institute of Aging, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, Drug Abuse, Child Health and Human Development, uh, Neurology, uh, Cancer Institute, et cetera. So you can kind of see as you go down the list. I, I will say that all of these institutes and centers fund some behavioral and social science research on this. Obviously the most important thing to do is be sure that you're aligning what you want to do with the mission of those institutes as you think about um, the institutes that are probably most appropriate for funding of the um, grant applications that you have. And, and keep in mind that some of these are on the smaller end on the right are not small in terms of their behavioral and social science effort as much as they're small and because their overall budget is relatively small, but they still account for a substantial amount of behavioral and social science research within their relatively small budgets. So it gives you a sense of how that looks um, by institute and center. Next slide. So um, we recently try to take a little bit more of a closer look at sort of the behavioral and social science research funded by the NIH and what are some of the content areas and, and using some natural language processing and clustering approaches, we were able to uh, define essentially sort of 13 sort of subgroups of behavioral and social science research that we fund, everything from addictive behaviors to stress, trauma, and resilience. And you can kind of get a sense of the general I won't read through all 13 of them, but give you a sense of the general sort of framework of the type of things that we fund. So next slide. Um, and in terms of the types of things that we fund in terms of uh, prevalence of them, um, areas like attention, learning and memory and social processes and determinants are areas that we most strongly fund at the NIH. Mental health and developmental processes also relatively high. I will notice you go down that list, you'll notice that sleep and sexual behaviors are, are relatively small um, percentages of funding or proportions of funding for behavioral and social sciences research at the NIH. We had a recent, um, actually still wrapping it up, basic behavioral and social science research working group of the NIH Council of Councils that was looking at all the research that we fund in basic field and made the point of sort of talking about the need to actually do more foundational research on sleep and on sexual behaviors than we currently fund at the NIH. So that's something that we hope to sort of um, ameliorate in the future. Next slide. So I wanted to spend most of my time on, since this is about collaborative collisions on integration and collaborations um, and integration of the behavioral and social sciences at the NIH. So next slide. Um, Norm Anderson, who's currently with all of you at FSU, was the first um, NI, uh, OBSSR director. Um, and I, I think one of the major influences among many of, of Norman's time at OBSSR was this focus on integrating behavioral and social sciences within the larger biomedical research enterprise at the NIH. Um, and so as I was coming into the position at OBSSR, looking at the types of things that need to be done. I was very influenced by Norman's early work and by this particular paper in 1997 um, and wanted to make sure we carried on this perspective of increasingly integrating behavioral and social science research within the larger NIH biomedical enterprise. And that's not only in, I mean, the, the obvious places are like in neuroscience, for instance, right? Or in behavioral genetics. Um, but it also includes increasingly in computer science and engineering approaches and biomedical engineering approaches and some of the other places where we can integrate our sciences. And I think at the end, um, produce a stronger um, science overall by integrating these things together and more productive. Thanks. So there's a lot of places where we've done this already. Um, and this is just a few examples of it. Some of these um, trans NIH projects are very social and behavioral in nature, the science of behavior change, and OpNet, which is our basic behavioral and social science or trans NIH initiative. So those are very clearly sort of behavioral in nature. The brain initiative and the blueprint initiative are more neuroscience oriented, and we uh, work to make sure that 
behavioral and social science is sort of integrated within that, particularly in areas like social neuroscience and that type of thing. We have a number of large uh, trans NIH um, epidemiologic efforts, um, the environmental influence on child health outcomes, adolescent brain and cognitive development effort, um, and the All of Us program, all are sort of large cohort studies, longitudinal cohort studies that have a substantial social and behavioral set of variables being assessed over that longitudinal process. And all are resources that as they become more available, researchers can use and pull from to be able to do their research. Um, so just a few examples of the types of things where we've integrated. I'm gonna focus on three areas um, briefly. So let me do the next slide. So um, obviously we spent a little time in the last year on the integration of social and behavioral sciences in COVID-19 research. Um, I'm just gonna show you a few of the key places where we've worked in that area. One has been in um, ensuring as best as we can some consistency um, and collaboration around the measures that we use. So back last March, um, as the, um, as the pandemic was growing and, and the concern was increasing, um, a number of uh, researchers with current surveys already out in the field were starting to add COVID-19 specific items to their surveys and then clinical practice and the patient reported outcomes, new measures were being developed. And they were being developed so quickly and so urgently that we really didn't have the time to sort of say, okay, let's determine best practices and let's come up with consensus measures that we'll all agree to. By the time we had done that, the pandemic would hopefully be over. Um, so instead, what we decided to do is just ask existing researchers doing this work to share their COVID-19 specific survey items with the field more generally. And so we now have over a hundred surveys in this repository. Um, and there are two places where you can find it. The one on the left is in the Phoenix Toolkit, which I think many people are familiar with. It's being used for a lot of different um, efforts. And Phoenix actually took a lot of the work that people put in and actually created their own sort of protocols for COVID-19 specific research collections. So they basically sliced and diced some of these surveys into sort of various sort of protocol sets that people could use. And then the, the full surveys are available on the DR2 website, uh, which is the um, NIH's uh, disaster research program um, website um, for putting all that information together as well. So there's a list of all of the various surveys in their full form um, for people to be able to pull from. And our hope is that as people have done this research and continue to do this research, that they at least visit these sites determine what sort of measures and survey items they could pull from it so that that in, encourages sort of data comparison, data coordination and integration across all these areas, particularly in a lot of the social and behavioral aspects of this um, effort moving forward. So next slide. Um, the biggest project that we've had at the NIH has been uh, RADx up or RADx in underserved populations. Um, Congress back in May um, appropriated $1.8 billion to the NIH for testing initiatives. A, a substantial amount of that money went to um, the kind of typical thing you would think, right? Shark tanks to speed up the process of developing new and innovative testing methods. And um, there's been a lot of really exciting and rapid research that's been developed in that space to increase the type of testing and diagnostic procedures that are available. But also a very substantial portion, 500 million of that, uh, went to this project, which is focused on testing uptake in underserved and vulnerable populations across the U.S. As you know, there's a pretty critical health disparities issue in health uh, in uh, COVID-19, not only in hospitalizations and deaths from COVID, but even in the infection rates themselves, um, um, being sort of disparate across various groups. And so that's been a critical sort of concern. And then of course, testing, it's not enough just to have tests available. People have to actually uptake those tests. They have, to, they have to use them. And then they have to appropriately quarantine if they test positive and not drop their guard of the mitigation behaviors if they test negative. So all of those things are important components of this. So this is a project that's already the first phase is in the field. The second phase is coming. Um, so that'll help us with um, trying to understand a lot of that work better. And that also includes some interesting work going on right now in testing in the school systems 
in a lot of these communities to determine how quickly and how rapidly we can effectively test students, parents, teachers, et cetera, to be able to open schools as quickly as possible. So next slide. Um, this has been a smaller initiative because it didn't have any uh, supplemental appropriation from Congress. So we basically pulled together existing resources from OBSSR and from a number of institutes and centers to look specifically at the social, behavioral, and economic impacts of COVID. And the, rap the first thing that we could do fairly rapidly was do supplements to existing grants, which we did with 52 supplements um, using both um, Institute pool and center pool funds, as well as funds from o the Office of the Director and from OBSSR to help pull some of this together and fund a, a variety of research looking at all the various implications socially um, in terms of behavior, economic impacts, and those sort of things. So, I mean, one of the things that happened early in the pandemic, obviously, was we had to get mitigation strategies out. We weren't sure how beneficial they were and we weren't sure what their costs were. So we're still trying to study exactly what those costs are. So that was one of the efforts. We also did um, some intervention research. The two PARs are out there on the street right now looking at both digital health and community health interventions to sort of bridge the gap in this virtual world of how to deliver those interventions to people as we move forward. And then we supplement a number of large individual studies, and we also funded the National Bureau of Economic Research to conduct some economic research on COVID-19 and a few other projects that are coming down the pipeline to help sort of address that. So next slide. And then finally, in the COVID space, um, we were concerned that, you know, all the, with vaccinations coming out in December and January, um, that we were ill-prepared, or at least policymakers and, and some of the people in the field were ill-prepared to be able to communicate effectively about addressing vaccine hesitancy and fostering vaccine confidence. Um, so we put together an expert panel of people in the field that um, understand sort of communication of vaccinations more broadly um, and created a report um, that's sort of guidance for a range of people in the field. Um, to address sort of vaccine hesitancy and foster vaccine confidence and communicate about vaccinations um, across the board. So what you see on the right is just a single fact sheet page about sort of do's and don'ts about um, doing this work. But there's an entire report that's on the OBSSR website as well as the NIH COVID site um, that people can download and take a look at if they like. Next, okay. So let me shift gears just for a second on two other examples. Um, it's hard to remember, but before there was a, a COVID pandemic crisis, there was an opioid crisis. We, we still had that crisis ongoing um, and actually worsening as a result of the pandemic. Um, and in the early days of the HEAL initiative, um, most of the, uh, during its formative stages, most of the workshops that were being developed were mostly biomedical in nature. And we felt like we, had, once again, needed to ensure that we were integrating some of the social and behavioral aspects of um, this research uh, related to opioids and chronic pain management and that sort of thing. So um, we developed and had a, a workshop um, kind of in, integrated with the rest of that work on the contributions of social and behavioral research to the opioid epidemic. And the result of that was a HEAL initiative that actually now includes, I think, a really nice sort of breadth of integrated work that includes behavioral as well as biomedical research in this field. So uh, the top right is behavioral research specifically to improve medication uh, assisted treatments for, um, for um, opioid use, um, healing community study, which is a set of initiatives and studies um, looking at a more uh, community-based sort of model for addressing opioid um, use and abuse and also chronic disease management or pain management. And then the uh, justice community opioid uh, research. Um, as you know, most of this, um, most of what we see in this field actually gets treated by the criminal justice system, not necessarily as much by the health system. Um, so that integration with the justice community and with criminal justice systems to be able to deliver um, effective opioid uh, use disorder treatments was something really important that we wanted to make sure we did. And at the bottom is really small. We also, um, stigma is actually a pretty significant component of this. So one of the things our office led as part of the HEAL initiative were supplements to 
um, reduce the stigma in both pain management and opioid use disorder. So um, those were just funded recently in the last year. And then one more slide. So the last thing I wanted to mention was the work that we've been doing in firearm violence prevention. Um, Congress, both last year and this year, um, provided funding 12.5 million each year um, for firearm violence prevention. Um, and the sense that I have with the current administration is that there'll probably actually be more of this coming along the way, but this has been a good start for us after many years of not being able to do much in the way of firearm violence prevention and to treat firearm violence as a public health issue. And so um, last year we funded um, nine projects specifically looking at a range of, of interventions and approaches and evaluations of policy and various other things to look at how do we um, reduce firearm violence. Um, and that's both suicide and homicide. People forget that um, depending on which group you're looking at, some, it's a 60-40 split of sort of suicide to homicide or homicide to suicide. But, but suicide makes up a substantial proportion of the deaths that come from firearms. Um, so both the suicide and homicide end of this, um, trying to address those. Um, and we have two initiatives that are out on the street now for people to respond to. One is an R01 and the other is, uh, if you're not quite ready for an R01, sort of an R21, which is a smaller grant mechanism followed by a subsequent R33. So it's kind of a two-part thing. If you're still in the stage of doing preliminary research and developing interventions before you roll them out and test them more effectively. So both of those are available uh, for people to take a look at um, if you're interested in the firearm violence space. And this has been something that our office has been pretty significantly involved in and hope to be involved in a bit more in the course of time. So, Mike, I think that's it. Let me see if the next slide has anything. There we go. The, the final ending slide as usual. Um, so um, I'm happy to take questions now uh, as time permits. Also happy to, um, if people want to email me, I'm happy to respond back and um, follow up on anything that you have questions about. And of course, we always like people to follow our emails and newsletter. And uh, we, we promise not to ping you too often if you're a social or behavioral scientists and just want to kind of stay on the listserv for us. Um, we typically do just a monthly newsletter so we can kind of keep people up to date on some of the things going on at NIH. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Mike. Of course, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. Um, and uh, we do have a few minutes for questions if you're you're up for it and willing to stick around. Sure. Um, one of the questions that I was wondering about as, as you were talking is, um, it seems like this is an area in which there may be a significant opportunity for overlap between NIH and the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of uh, cooperation between the two agencies? And when would a researcher go to NIH versus NSF, especially yeah. if it were related to health in, in some way? Yeah, yeah. So, so we, we do interact um, fairly regularly. Um, so the Social Behavioral and Economics Directorate at the NSF and our office collaborate on a number of efforts and, and work together. Um, I'm actually an ex officio member of the Social Behavioral and Economic Director of NSF's Council, so I kind of keep up with it that way as well. Um, we have a few collaborative efforts, but it may not surprise people that even though we're we're both federal government agencies, we don't actually function <laughs> exactly the same way. So it's it's difficult for us to really do sort of collaborations and coordinated efforts easily just because of the different sort of uh, appropriations language and legislation that we have to follow for our two agencies. Um, but we do try to coordinate as best as we can. On, on the question about where things go, you know, the 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 simple answer is usually if it's health oriented, it goes to the NIH. And if it's not health oriented, social and behavioral and economic science, it goes to NSF. But that's not totally true, right? Because, you know, NSF funds a, a fair amount of uh, both biologically influenced research as well as neuroscience research at the very basic level at NSF. And we, of course, um, fund some research that some people might think is so social oriented that they kind of wonder what its value to health is. So we'll look at sort of residential housing and its impacts on health, some of those more um, societal types of things. So um, usually what I ask people to do is if you're not sure, you kind of feel like you're sitting on the cusp between those two, um, is to call me or talk to somebody at NSF, but just sort of sort out sort of what the interests are and kind of 
take your pick based on that. Uh, perhaps kind of related question there. Uh, if a PI is interested in conducting some behavioral or social sciences research within a particular institute at NIH, mm -hmm. is there a way for them to designate that it is behavioral or social sciences research? Or does the um, program officer just identify that based on the proposal? They'll, you know, they'll, they'll identify that based on the proposal. Um, you know, one of the things our office does, because you know, the behavioral and social sciences are spread across so many institutes, we'll sometimes provide assistance on, I have this research idea. I'm not sure whether it ought to go to NCI or NHLBI or NICHD or NIA, right? So um, we'll sometimes sort of sort through that. And since we know and have the network to know who are the people to respond to, people can always reach out to our office as a first step if they don't know which institute or center to link to, and then we can help them get connected to the right people. When those proposals come in, uh, are they reviewed by the same panels that review all NIH proposals or is there specific social sciences? Uh, yeah, so there, yeah. Um, so there's a, a really large center for scientific review that does um, our peer review study sections or also peer review study sections within each of the institutes. So it's a little complicated in the way this works out, but there are a number of study sections or review panels that are specifically in the social and behavioral sciences. So for instance, there's one that's totally focused on the research that comes in around community influences. There's one specifically on health disparities. There's one specifically on cognition and learning, right? So um, as those applications come in, they go to those study sections almost independently and separately of what institute or center might fund them. And then from that, based on their score um, and rating, then the institutes and centers make a determination about who's gonna fund and how. I have one last question for you. Would you mind sharing uh, your favorite story about your time at Florida State? <laughs> uh, well, well, first of all, I have to filter a little bit on that one, probably. <laughs> um, so I, I will. I will tell you the one. The one thing that I, I tell people about um, about Florida State. So I lived in graduate student housing in Alumni Village. I don't even know if it still exists. They probably no. If they bulldozed no. it over, I'm sure many years ago because it was barely livable when I lived there back in the early 80s. Um, but there was graduate student housing and it was right across the well actually next to um, the Florida State golf course. And so my Friday mornings I usually went to play golf before I went to the research team meeting um, at lunch. So I'd get up early Friday morning and play golf. Um, so my claim to fame is that um, I, I once met Bobby Bowden and had coffee with him um what because he was at the golf course playing golf so that was um so i got to hang out with him and uh describe to him all the various ways i thought we could improve the fsu seminoles football team <laughs> over the course of that time so that was a lot of fun but yeah those it, it was a really nice time being at florida state for those four years i got to meet uh willie taggart in an elevator one time in the uh the stadium oh, yeah? over there about yeah. a week before he got fired. So that oh. was not uh, not quite as good as your story. But Bill, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I really appreciate it, folks. Uh, email address, uh, social media contacts, and website are up on slide now, which will also be shared with everyone uh, after the event. And uh, you're going to stick around and do some of the presentations, correct? I'm going to stick around as long as I can.